also like to talk to you about um, a proposed rule in um, that came out in June that would apparently modify the treatment of manufacturer coupons with respect to the Medicaid best price rules. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the extent of my understanding. So maybe for this, uh, the listeners and the viewers out there, you sort of explain what that rule is about and how it will affect coupons and maybe also the accumulator programs. Yeah, sure. So at the outset, I want to emphasize that, that that is a proposed rule. So that's not currently the law, uh, but it could become the law uh, in some uh, some sort of form. Uh, uh, but this would would definitely have a pretty uh, substantial impact on the uh, on the compliance landscape. And so CMS, as you noted, issued a proposed rule in June of this year, and that would have re revised the treatment of manufacturer uh, patient assistance. So that could be coupons or other forms of assistance um, and how that is uh, treated under the uh, best price rules of the Medicaid drug rebate program. So historically, drug coupons and other forms of patient assistance have been um, generally excluded from the calculation of best price as long as that assistance is structured in a certain way by the manufacturer that, that it meets certain criteria. Now, um, best price is important, of course, because it is used to determine the amount of rebates that a manufacturer must pay to the government in order to participate in the Medicaid uh, program. So in the proposed rule, what CMS would be changing is that they would be saying that in order to still qualify for that exception from best price, the um, coupon or other assistance, it, all of it, the entire value that has to be only directed at the beneficiary. And then on top of that, the government is arguing that when you have a scenario where a plan or PBM is applying an accumulator, that they, they contend that the value of the coupon is not 100% going to the beneficiary. Instead, the, the, you know, the, the planner PBM is sort of extracting some of that value. So, um, you know, as a result of this um, uh, rule, if it was to be finalized, manufacturers first would have to identify uh, the circumstances in which a, a planner PBM is applying a uh, accumulator to block the coupon from applying. And then in those situations would need to uh, make sure that the value of that particular coupon is um, not excluded from best price, but instead included in best price. And when coupons are included into best price, um, the result is that the manufacturers ultimately have to pay a higher uh, rebate amount to the government. Uh, so the, the net effect is to increase their financial liability under the Medicaid drug rebate program. So manufacturers, stakeholders um, ha have noted in response to this proposed rule that um, first of all, there's a real practical issue here. And that is, it, it's very difficult, perhaps even impossible for a manufacturer to determine uh, in every situation where a plan or PBM may be um, applying an accumulator. So a lot of times there's no, you know, publicly available information. Um, so that can really just be a, a real difficulty there to identify when they apply. So given that dif difficulty, um, I would I would think that manufacturers, many would, would take um, different sort of course of action. One may be uh, that the manufacturers would say, well, you know, given the, the legal risks of not being able to comply with the best price rules, they may just take the presumption that an accumulator is applying and therefore all their coupons would, you know, be included into best price and they would have to sort of take that financial hit. Um, another sort of behavioral reaction could be that 
some manufacturers may say, you know, given the risks and given the increased financial liability, we may just um, decrease the amount of patient assistance that we offer um, in the market. So um, those are, you know, two potential outcomes um, that, that could result. In, and in the meantime, you know, plans would be even further empowered um, by this sort of rule. They would have even more flexibility um, to, to use accumulators um, in these sort of circumstances. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to, to sort of see what happens here. Um, there, there is a, a, an, an irony here too, because if this proposed rule was to be finalized, um, I, I think it, it could uh, lower the amount of uh, financial assistance that's being offered um, on the market. And in turn, it could also increase or promote further plan adoption of accumulators. And, and there's an irony there because CMS has at times uh, expressed some concern about the impact in, in some situations of accumulators uh, to beneficiaries. So th this could have uh, really the opposite effect. So there, there's a lot of money at stake here. Um, so it'll be important to you know, really monitor uh, what happens with this proposed rule and this proposed change to best price and whether or not it will in fact be finalized. Yeah, the will it in fact be finalized, presumably with a new administration, um, given that it's a proposed rule, um, it, isn't it very likely that it will not come to be, or if it does, it will not come to be for quite some time, or is there a sort of a clock ticking and it has can only stay proposed for so long? And um, Yeah, well, you know, I, I think there's a lot of discussion. Um, you know, this is one of many rules um, that have, you know, has uh, come out of the government, uh, particularly from CMS and HHS recently, uh, that would look to reform um, pretty drastically certain areas of drug policy and and law. So there's a lot of discussion about what will be, uh, you know, further carried forward by the new administration. Um, I think it's pretty difficult to, to speculate um, on a lot of these. Um, you know, it's important to realize that I think the new administration uh, is also very keen on, on some uh, pretty substantial reform. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's even more difficult when you look at the accumulator space, because this is a pretty unique sort of area of the law. There really are um, trade-offs on both sides of the issue. Um, so it, it, it's a more complicated sort of niche area. And therefore, I think it's even harder to, to speculate on, on what's going to happen here. Uh, but uh, stakeholders will definitely need to monitor it closely. Yes. Yeah, so um, the last thing I wanted to discuss with you is uh, leaving Washington and looking at state action on accumulators. In the piece um, that you wrote for uh, Managed Healthcare Executive, uh, you discussed how um, patient groups, some provider organizations have been pretty active in state capitals and with some success in moving ahead with regulations that rein in accumulators uh, uh, and I guess to some extent maximizers um, in a way that hasn't happened in Washington. So maybe you could just, without going through state by state, mm -hmm. um, highlight a few state, perhaps highlight a few states where some uh, law or regulations have gone into effect or may go into effect and whether there's a common thread to what the states are doing. Yeah, sure. So uh, like we, we, we discussed earlier, um, at the federal level, um, there's really been a trend towards um, allowing uh, plans and PBMs more latitude uh, to have, you know, implement these sort of um, accumulator maximizer programs. But at the state level, um, at least a handful of states have really gone in the opposite direction. So specifically, there are five states, um, Arizona, Georgia, Illinois, Virginia, and West Virginia, 
um, that have all implemented laws that would heavily restrict and pretty much prohibit the use of accumulators uh, and maximizers uh, for beneficiaries within their state, at least for fully insured plans. Um, these laws, um, the language of the laws, that they have a good amount of similarity to them. They're clearly based upon each other. Uh, a lot of the legislatures are watching each other uh, and, and the, the, the nature of their laws. And what they, what most of them say is that um, a plan has to um, make sure that um, any payment uh, made by a beneficiary or on behalf of a beneficiary must count against the uh, plan's uh, deductible and out-of-pocket limits. And that's significant because coupons, of course, are a payment originally by a manufacturer that's made on, you know, on behalf of, of, of the patient. So the, the reality, the real effect of these laws and the, the intention of these laws uh, is to prevent uh, plans from using accumulators and, and maximizers. So that's sort of the, the general similarity, but there, there are some kind of interesting uh, differences in, in some of the, the terms that are being used uh, in these provisions. So it is important to look at each uh, state law very closely. Uh, for example, some of the state's laws do have exceptions um, to cover instances, say, where uh, there, there may be a, you know, a generic that's also available, but other laws uh, do not have an exception. Uh, some of them uh, refer to only drugs covered under the pharmacy benefit, whereas others refer both to uh, drugs covered under the pharmacy and medical benefit. And, and that can be significant because so, some plans are starting to uh, explore how to apply accumulators to, to drugs covered under the medical benefit. Um, finally, some of the laws only refer to plans, whereas other ones refer to both plans and PBMs. But nevertheless, if you're a plan and you're contracted with the PBM and you're subject to that law, the plan would need to make sure that the PBM similarly uh, complies with any such restriction. So, you know, that, that's sort of a, a summary um, at the very basic level of what these laws are doing. But one of the most important things to remember is that these state laws um, would only apply to fully insured plans. So due to ERISA preemption, they would not apply to, to self-insured plans, which of course make up a substantial um, part of the um, commercial market. Um, the other thing too is that while five states, you know, we talk about a handful of states, uh, that might not sound like a lot, but it's important to realize that um, these laws have only come up in the last year or two. And um, around 20 state legislatures have considered a bill or are, um, are currently considering a bill to restrict uh, these sorts of programs. And they are receiving a, there's a good amount of bipartisan support in some of these state legislatures. Um, and, and so they, I believe it's a trend that's going on right now. Uh, and I think one can expect that, that an additional number of states will ultimately uh, pass some of these restrictions. So what you're starting to see is um, differences at the federal and state level trends going in the different directions and the, the um, result is a more com complicated um, coupon compliance landscape. So, uh, you know, stakeholders are really going to need to get appropriate expertise, um, you know, try to navigate these sometimes inconsistent laws. Um, and, and also, um, it, it's just a very quickly evolving area right now. So, Whatever the state of play is right now, um, that could very much change um, by next year at some point. And, um, you know, pity the poor uh, civilian, the poor patient who tries to figure this out. Um, is, is there any interesting uh, um, legal question about whether the states have the authority to make these rules? Is there any sort of... Uh, um, you know, 
question of state state authority in this realm, or does this fall safely into the um, uh, long established uh, uh, framework that states uh, can regulate um, insurers that, that um, as long as it you know ERISA doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I'm not aware of any legal challenges to any to any of these laws or, or really any discussion around it. Um, I, I would think on the surface that states do have, um, you know, appropriate uh, authority under their, you know, insurance powers to, you know, they can regulate local insurance and fully insured uh, plans and, and cost sharing, um, formulary requirements, these sorts of things. I mean, that does fall within the, I think, the traditional purview of state law. There have been questions about the extent to which, um, uh, you know, plans can, uh, you know, regulate uh, PBMs and so forth, and and and, and their interaction with, um, uh, with their plans, uh, and that is being addressed by the the Supreme Court right now. Um, but I th I think most of these laws, you know, they really are primarily focused upon uh, the plans themselves. Uh, they 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 are. Um, very much focused on this this one issue. I, I don't think that they're they're overbroad, um, but but who knows? Again, it's a very controversial uh, area, uh, a lot of money at stake. Uh, so I I would expect the unexpected to happen uh, in, in the next year or two.